The ocean is full of mysterious creatures, especially the deep sea. Well, that's what people often say. However, marine creatures of the shallow water could also be mysterious. For example, recently, I realized that not a lot of people know about the existence of salps, even though they are quite abundant. So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is salp? If it's not obvious enough, salps are animals. Even though they might look like jellyfish or something similar, they are not closely related to the jellyfish at all. They are classified in the phylum chordata, commonly known as chordate in English. Vertebrata, which is the vertebrates like us, you know, humans and deers, are also classified in this phylum. However, salps are not vertebrates. They are tunicates. Some of you might have heard of sea squirts. That's also a tunicate. But most of you probably wouldn't think of tunicate when you look at salps. Because most of the relatively famous tunicate are sedentary benthic animals. Meanwhile, salps are not. Salps, together with other members of their class, classes Thaliaceae, aka Thaliaceans in English, are free floating. Salps themselves are its own order, Salpida, with only one extant family, Salpidae. There are several genera and species though. In 2011, more than 40 valid species was listed. So yeah, like I said, they are quite abundant. Salps are basically cosmopolitan, meaning their distribution is literally widespread. In this case, they can be found in every ocean, even towards the Antarctic. They can mostly be found in shallow water, but some can be found deeper towards the 800 meters depth. Oh, by the way, some people call them salpa, in which case the plural will be salpi. But salpas is valid too, as far as I know. Basically, just choose whichever is easier to pronounce for you. Salps were discovered a long time ago. They were described in 1756, in the genus Thalia. However, we didn't know much about them back then. So the taxonomic consistency was, let's just say, basically non-existent. Linnaeus classified them in the genus Holothuria, which is sea cucumbers. Some also give two different scientific names to different forms of salps. Oh, yes, a species of salps have multiple forms, which I'll talk about. So let's move on to the next section. Salps are generally tubular and transparent. Their sizes vary between species. Salpa fusiformis is small, growing only up to 5 cm. Meanwhile, Thetis fagina can grow up to 30 cm or even slightly more. Oh, by the way, this fagina epithet does not revert to the reproductive organ. It means sheath. Anyway, they have two different forms, corresponding to two different life stages. The first one is called ozoid, which is the solitary asexual stage. The second is called blastozoid which is the aggregate and sexual stage. In general, both ozoid and blastozoid still have the same structures and functions. They have two main orifices, one in front and one behind. The front orifice is called oral siphon, sometimes also called incurrent siphon. The hind orifice is called atrial siphon, sometimes also called excurrent siphon. They have gills along a branchial basket. Branchial basket is basically their respiratory tract. They have endostyles along the way into their intestines. Oh and, yeah, they have intestines and guts, which are usually noticeable because they have solid color among the transparent organs. Another relatively noticeable organ is their eye, which is usually reddish-orange, albeit quite small. Next to this eye, you can see their ganglion with its nerve fibers. They also have heart near their intestines and guts. Another important structure, both for their life and for us humans, is the muscle bands. I say it for us humans because we use this to identify them. Muscle bands vary between species. Their numbers, how they orient, and how full are they. Some species have almost full circle muscle bands, while some end abruptly like this one. Another structure which is important for identification is their dorsal tubercle, which is a small canal connecting the neural gland to the branchial basket. Oh, by the way, while both stages basically have the same structures, there are some differences of course. 
Blastozoids generally have thicker and wider mantle. The muscle bands are also different in numbers and sometimes orientation. So yeah, another very noticeable difference is the fact that blastozoid aggregates with each other, forming a long chain like this, or in some species, a circular ring like this. Now, let's talk about their lifestyle and behavior. But before that, Like I said earlier, unlike many other tunicates, salps are not benthic animals. Salps are pelagic, meaning they exist in the water column, not on the bottom of the water body. Now, if you read many articles about salps, you'll notice that some of those mention that they are planktonic. Some even call them zooplankton. Planktonic, by definition, is not about the size. Planktonic is about movement or perhaps the lack of movement. Planktonic animals are drifters, meaning they just follow the current. Or, to be precise, an organism is technically considered planktonic if they cannot go against the current. So, what about salps? Well, salps can propel themselves by sucking and expelling water. It's called jet propulsion. This is a well-known behavior that had been published almost half a century ago. Which is why I'm quite confused of why are they still being called planktonic. Perhaps technically they still use the water current because their jet propulsion uses the water current, but that would mean the definition of planktonic animals need to be revised or clarified. But anyway, yeah, their muscle bands contract their body, which is what enables them to do the jet propulsion. In this video right here, you can see the green stuff is the water movement when they propel themselves not only in the oozoid phase. Of course, they could also do so in their aggregate blastozoid phase. Whether it's a species that forms a ring or a species that forms a chain, they could still propel themselves. Oh, by the way, that includes the one that forms a long chain. And it's kinda cool seeing them corkscrewing around like this. So yeah, this jet propulsion mechanism not only helps them move, but also this is how they eat. They can actively pump water in and filter food from the water. This is also why nowadays they are often used as biological samplers to estimate pollutants, including microplastic. Oh, by the way, an aggregate of blastozoids don't connect from orifice to orifice like the thing in human centipede. Each blastozoid suck and expel their own water. Okay, so it's finally time to talk about their life cycle. Let's start with blastozoids. This chain is an aggregate. Each of these are technically its own individual, its own blastozoid. Each of these can reproduce. Blastozoids are sequential hermaphrodites. To be precise, they are protogenous hermaphrodites, meaning they start as females and then become males later on. The older one, aka the males, will fertilize the females. From this fertilization, an ozoid will be formed. Ozoid will swim away from this aggregate, living a solitary life. After it matures, ozoid will produce clones by body. These clones will form the aggregate of blastozoid. And yes, that's the life cycle. Ozoid is called ozoid because it's produced from the ovum, while blastozoids are called blastozoids because it's produced from blastogenesis. Oh, by the way, these life stages are not seasonal. Both ozoids and blastozoids exist at the same time in the sea. One of the exceptional things about them in terms of ecosystem balance is how they rapidly proliferate when a phytoplankton bloom is happening. Of course, it's intuitive that a season of bountiful food source brings those who eat it. However, the rate at which they proliferate is way faster than most animals we know. During phytoplankton blooms, you could see tons of blastozoid aggregates which could be quite scary if you didn't know about this phenomenon. Now that you are, this phenomenon can be an interesting sight for you, maybe even beautiful. It could also be beneficial to the ecosystem. When these phenomena happen, a lot of pellets will be produced, which will sink to the bottom of the ocean. This will transport carbon from the surface to the deeper zone. Besides that, salps are also eaten by many predators. Oh, and also, Small marine creatures sometimes live among the salps aggregate. For example, the Argonauts which I talked about last week. 
check that video out if you haven't. All in all, salps are very important for the ocean ecosystem. Salps were confusing for us, but as our knowledge of them grows, interest towards them keeps growing from both the academic and public. Lately, several research had been done to see their potential as bioindicators, and their importance for the ecosystem keeps getting uncovered. Who knows what else will be discovered in the future? But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, I will be quite busy until early March, which means I won't be able to read comments. If you got any question or discussion, I would suggest joining our Discord server and ask them. Anyway, enjoy your day.